I can only show you 20 minutes of new gameplay from Total War 3 Kingdoms, so let's not waste time and jump right in. Creative Assembly invited players to a press event out in San Francisco so we could try the first 30 turns of Liu Bei's campaign. There was just so much to see that I'm sure I'm going to forget to go over something here, so if you have a question about anything you see here, or about something I played or might have played in the game, feel free to ask below and I'll try my best to answer from my memory. In the pyre, the hand falters. Yet the light of the dynasty still simmers in the hearts of its last descendants. Liu Bei swore an oath with his brothers. They pledged their lives. They will defend the Han. Nobody else can. Whenever you boot up 3K, you'll be greeted by these gorgeous loading screens that tell the story of the game. But what's cool about them is that they're actually dynamic. As you progress through your campaign, they'll actually update to tell your story so far and serve as a recap every time you load into the game. The first thing you'll notice though is that the campaign map is gorgeous. Uh, the game here is running at max settings with every visual effect ticked on and with only the occasional FPS drop, which is to be expected as the machines we were playing on were ridiculously powerful. The most noticeable new visual tweaks are temporal anti-aliasing and a sharpening filter as well as a slight depth of field on the campaign map. TAA keeps things sharper while using less resources, and the sharpening filter, uh, well, let's just say CA made sure to point out though that they are still tweaking the strength, as it makes some of the outlines around the characters a bit too harsh to my eyes, but as it can be turned off anyway, that's really no big concern, and honestly is a bit of preferential. The opening missions are paced to ease you into the mechanics of Three Kingdoms, complete with the period appropriate flavor text. Every bit of the UI here uses the ink brush motif, and continues to provide a distinct visual style for Three Kingdoms. Kingdoms. You'll also notice that the auto resolve button has been changed to delegate, meaning that you let the generals fight for themselves, another thematic change. Loading into battles, you're greeted with the return of general speeches. Any lords you have in your retinue will discuss the upcoming battle and even smack talk a bit. Though the accents are all over the with place. unified purpose, we go forward. We have come this far. We cannot fail here. Our only option is victory. I've been told a Chinese voice localization pack will be available if you prefer to use that instead. You'll notice the loading times were rather slow here as we were playing off hard drives, but if you played Warhammer 2, you know the loading speeds and in turn times are tremendously helped by solid states, and Three Kingdoms appears to be no exception. The battles in 3K feel like a combination of Warhammer and Attila, specifically the power of the heroes is remarkable, while the armies themselves clash together with a good hefty bit of weight behind them. The basic strategy though for starting as Liu Bei is to send Guan Yu to kill the enemy general, send Zhang Fei into the thick of battle and then use his special roar ability to give a negative 100 morale around him and instantly rout the enemy's army, and then you can mop up anybody still standing around with the main army buffed up by Liu Bei. It's not exactly exactly high strategy, but it works. CA did say at the event that the heroes were overpowered in this build, uh, and this wasn't helped by the fact that each of them and this wasn't helped by the fact that each of the three sworn brothers already wields a mythically overpowered weapon already in their inventory. But I suspect that Liu Bei's campaign, which will be far and away likely the most popular and one of the first campaigns played, is also likely to be one of the easiest. And yes, it does look like CA will release a Blood Pack DLC shortly after the game's release. Liu Bei has a faction mechanic that allows the recruitment of zero upkeep cost peasant levy units, and gains an additional resource called Unity, which can be spent to annex Han Empire settlements with no conflict. I ended up using that ability time and time again in my playthrough, because why fight if they'll just give it to you? Between his superpowered allies, cheap spam units, and annexation ability, uh, it ensures he'll quickly snowball in the campaign, uh, though when you first begin anyway, he's just a wandering army with no home base, so you definitely need that extra kick and boost. CA has also added a new help function, so if you press F1, it activates a help overlay on the screen, actually telling you what each one of the buttons on the screen does. 
Each of the early missions actually introduces you to a new game system, recruitment, leveling up, and capturing and building settlements. And battles even now have a handy auto formation, where if you select your armies, drag and then drop, the army will instantly sort itself into spearmen to the front, archers to the backs, cavalry on the wings, and your heroes to the spot they should most likely be. Though you can still always place them manually if you want to and come up with any crazy formation you want to try. On the campaign map, one of the big changes is actually in how settlements are structured. Small settlements are now defined by a resource type, and when fighting for them, you'll actually be transported to a map that reflects the resource. Uh, here we're fighting over an iron mine, and you can see the accompanying settlement sprawled across the map. Every minor settlement now becomes something of a mini siege map, with its own points that have to be taken and towers that must be gotten through. It's similar to the building system put in place by Thrones of Britannia, except here they made sure to give them garrisons. So they're not just pushovers. Back on the campaign map, the visuals are easily the biggest improvement from previous historical Total Wars. The map here uses exaggerated terrain to give a sense of place, and changes with the seasons as well as having Total War's first ever day-night cycle. Uh, by default, it cycles every 20 minutes, uh, but you can actually set it up to sync up to your local time as well if you always want to be playing in the day or the night if you're you know, a night owl. A newly recruited unit will report for duty immediately, but will continue to muster for some time before reaching full capacity. Any character that you have in-game has their abilities divided between authority, expertise, cunning, resolve, and instinct, uh, each of which provides bonuses detailed in their tooltips. The five different character types favor one of the corresponding traits, with Guan Yu, the champion, having high resolve. But beyond just giving buffs to the character, these stats also give bonuses to certain units if recruited by that lord, meaning that vanguards get bonuses to shock cavalry and melee damage, while champions get bonuses to spear infantry and armor. So you want to make sure that the retinue recruited to your character matches their best abilities if you want to get the most out of them. It's a nice bit of min-maxing for the old hand Total War player who wants to get a little deeper into the numbers. And in case you're worried about in turn times, here's an actual in turn. It lasts all of 10 seconds. For characters, ancillaries, armor, and weapons Special do make a return with additional mounts and, and followers and can accessories. Can be taken from defeated enemies and will grant great advantages to their new owner as well as increasing their satisfaction. Detailed character skills also make a return, though they're very pared down from their Warhammer versions and much more reflective of a historical total war, not being too overpowered or granting any incredibly insane abilities. Besides being generals and governors, your characters also have the abilities to be recruited as spies, but you'll notice I haven't mentioned that up until now. See, they're tied to Imperium level now, and unlock at Imperium level 2, which happens at around turn 30, or roughly 2 hours in, and wasn't reached in my time playing. Which isn't a bad thing, because the character management you're presented at the beginning of the game can be a bit overwhelming at times, so it's a good thing they're easing it in. But the way the game led me through quests and objective design, I really wasn't missing them yet. Everything has been changed just enough that I had to slow down and figure out where things were and how they worked. Politics in particular feels significantly beefed up, with interactions between characters suddenly taking on a global feel. Kong Ming actually approached and offered to Your form a coalition with me. A and as I was gobbling up the remnants of the Han Empire around my starting position, so were the other warlords. It was clear that in a short time, super empires would be formed, and would be forced to turn on one another if they wanted to continue expanding. The alliances I was making now, in a few turns, were going to pay dividends when suddenly these great wars broke out. Having character portraits on the politics screen also goes a long way to make it feel like you're playing against characters instead of computers. It's reminiscent of the style of the Civilization series, and gives your encounters more personality. The focus on character is really the defining characteristic of Three Kingdoms Total War. Our talks flow as smoothly as the river. Unit recruitment, though, has also been given a serious overhaul. When a new unit is recruited, it does so at half strength, and then solely musters up to full strength, a system piloted in Total War Thrones of Britannia. 
Your unit pool is also tied to population of a settlement, but this early in the game, I, I never ran into it as a restriction. What units you have available to recruit is also no longer tied to certain buildings, and is actually dictated by the level of your general. Once your commander has reached a high enough level, they'll have access to train special elite units. This also means that if your commander dies, that army won't be able to recruit these elite units again until you have a sufficiently influential general back in his place. But don't think that means you'll have to level a new one up from level zero. Thanks to the character recruitment pool, you can actually hire on new characters of any level at any time. Though you should be aware that they could be spies sent from enemy courts, so it's worth figuring out who you can trust in the game and who you should avoid. After all, we all want Lu Bu on our side, but there's no guarantee he'll stay around with you when the going gets tough. CA has also brought back the Man of the Hour mechanic, allowing certain captains who have distinguished themselves to become selectable characters. Speaking of untrustworthy warlords, Dong Zhou, while present on the map, didn't actually affect my early gameplay. I could always feel his presence and was aware of him as being my first big objective, but I didn't really get a chance to go and take my fight to him. In a scripted event, Dong Zhou actually was assassinated in my campaign. Now, I don't know if this happens on a set turn or if it's just a random chance every time. He's dead. Yet in the ashen darkness. The Avaricious Prowl. Leading a faction is costly, and good management of your economy is vital to support your campaign. But you'll notice that Lu Bu actually took over the faction. You can always wait for someone else to deal with him, but the prize is that anyone who defeats Dong Zhuo also gains control of the Boy Emperor, and by extension, the remaining Han Empire provinces. If you captured him early enough, it would be a significant boost to your empire. Your ultimate objective though for Three Kingdoms is to become emperor and unite all of China. But you do that in a different manner than from previous Total War games. Here, once your Imperium level gets high enough, you can declare yourself emperor. And once you press the button, it triggers the other factions to solidify, take sides, and then declare two other competing emperors, making it a true War of the Three Kingdoms. So unlike in, say, Shogun 2, where you declare yourself Daimyo and then suddenly the entire world oh, hates you, awesome. here it's still very much based on those early game alliances that you helped to forge. Even when the War of the Three Kingdoms begins, though, you won't be painting the map a single color to win. To eliminate an enemy emperor, you don't need to defeat them. You only need to seize their capital city. So if you plan your attack right, you can thrust a dagger directly into their heart, assuming you don't just run out of supplies along the way. Supplies are still a relatively new entry in the Total War series, uh, having been brought over from Thrones of Britannia, and they work pretty much the same here. They represent the food and supplies that your army would consume while afield. Your army replenishes them while in your own or allied territory, and uses them when in enemy territory, creating a limit on just how far from home your army can rove. Another new aspect of the game is the Dilemma System. I did manage to trigger Lu Bei's first dilemma situation, where you're forced to make a choice that can alter the course of the game. His revolves around whether or not to protect Tao Chen against an invasion by Tao Tao. The game even provides you with a nice little summary to give you the event context, and a little flag that says, as it was told, to let you know what happened in the original Three Kingdoms era, should you want to follow history. And as I knew things eventually worked out for old long-eared Louis here, I went with history and honestly didn't see much of a difference in my campaign for the next few terms. I had expected a war declaration from Tao Tao or in an instant invasion, but Three Kingdoms is much subtler than that. There were wheels moving in the background, but I just hadn't seen them yet. So when Tao Chin died, he did so without an heir, and I actually inherited his empire and all of his armies and generals. But as I already have my own truly kick-butt army, I didn't need Tao Chin's, so I just dismissed them something they didn't particularly like, so they chose to leave my service and were recruited by the other surrounding warlords, including Tao Tao. It's a nice change of pace to play a Total War game where the characters hold so much weight, and seemingly benign choices can snowball into late game alliances against you with your own ex-generals leading the charge that you trained.
Characters can also be gained through conquest. If you fight an enemy army with multiple characters in it, there's always a chance you can capture the enemy at the end of the battle, though it didn't happen in my campaign. You'll then have the ability to either recruit them, release them, or execute them, giving you a potential pool of new powerful generals. Many features though will be very familiar to experienced Total War players. The building browser is reminiscent of Shogun 2, with a main building and several smaller ones that can be upgraded and divide along a pathway. You can tear down the minor capital buildings and build something else in their place, but at least in my playthrough, whenever I captured a major city, uh, the buildings were already actually the correct ones to be there. The AI had actually found the right thing to build. It was a pleasant surprise, to say the least. Your population has grown so large that harvesting food is now a priority. I had a much tougher time, in fact, balancing the food mechanic, which returns from previous installments and forces you to make sure you have enough food to actually keep everything moving accordingly. Technology, on the other hand, has gotten a visual overhaul. The technology tree is now literally a tree, and got a pretty good laugh out of me when I saw it. Uh, it's a gorgeous way of representing it, though, with each branch representing a type of research – trade, commerce, military, etc. Uh, – with the end of each branch unlocking something notable. Uh, during his playthrough, Quill18, uh, streamer, noticed that the end of the trade chain unlocks the Silk Road and contact with the Roman Empire. So it's possible you might even see a lost legion buried somewhere in the game. When I got to the end of my two hours, I was disappointed I had to stop. I still wanted to go fight Lu Bu, and felt like I had only really scratched the surface of what the game had to offer. And it leaves me looking forward to the release of the game on March 7th of this year. As I said at the beginning, I only get 20 minutes to talk here, but as I have a couple minutes left over, I'm going to run out the time with the stuff that gave me the most pleasure in the game. Some really awesome battle footage. So enjoy the footage, and if you want to see an interview with the developers, do please check out that video which will be linked at the end of this one. It's a fun little conversation. And thanks for watching, because without you guys, I would never have even been given the opportunity to play this game. So yeah, I appreciate it. You're what makes videos like this even possible. So what do we have here? Looks like an uphill fight against Cao Cao, and already I would say the attacking army is at a bit of a disadvantage. You'll notice they don't have Guan Yu, which, uh, yeah, I've already shown just how ridiculously effective he can be. But instead we get a wedged cavalry charge. It looks like we're getting the Attila-style cavalry back that absolutely wreck anything in their path. Archers in this game, though, are not to be sneezed at. You'll notice here they're shooting at that line of spears coming directly at them, and I mean, these aren't even top-tier archers, and they really do melt anything that come towards them. Uh, the ability to fire over top of your troops has come back. You don't require a direct line of sight like you do in some versions of Total War, so you can definitely do arcing fire. And even though Lube is just a commander, I mean, he's a powerful guy. You can go out in here and do a surprising amount of damage with him. Our comrade is fueling the enemy general. You lack the strength to defeat me. Shut up and die. Take heed, warriors. Stand ready. So cool. I'm a big fan of the Shaw Brothers kung fu films, and uh, the fight scenes in this are definitely inspired by 70s kung fu in all the best ways. We have lost a unit. Nobody survived. The good man. You are a coward. The final example I'll leave here is actually a minor settlement siege battle uh, we've been defending. Now you'll notice that there are three lords attacking, and they're actually doing a three-pronged assault, which is basically unheard of for Total War AI. A comrade is being attacked! Oh, my God. 
Prepare. The dragon sees all. The wind whispers to me. Take heed, warriors. Destroy you them. will fall. At the ready. I've only got 10 seconds left, so I really got to make this last clip count. Yeah, that was totes worth it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out some of my other Total War content.